speaking of some of the bigger teams and Junior Johnson and Rainier and everything, um, how much help did you get from them as far as tires or parts or pieces or engines or anything or cars or whatever? Is that something that you went out and really? Yeah, well, most of the, like from Rainier and some of them, most of the help I got from them was just when I was in their way going through the inspection line, put them, help me push my car out of the way so they could get through quicker. <laughs> so that, that was the most, I mean, seriously, okay. that was the All most right. the help I got was get out of the way. But, you know, as far as what I was doing, it would be Petty's and Junior. They were the closest. Um, I went down Banjo's a couple of times. But, boy, Banjo, you know, he's got that little, used to have a sign that said, where money buys speed, how fast you want to go. Well, you couldn't afford to go to Pancho's too often. <laughs> go down there because, you know, he wanted yeah. good money for his used stuff because he was top of the line at, yeah. at that time. But I mostly I'd go down and get stuff from Junior and Richards, and all, especially when they went quit cross and went to Chevrolet. And I'd get tires. I'd go down Junior's. I mean, this is a funny story. We went to Martinsville. I went to Petty's. And Kyle said, I talked to him week before, and he said, we got a bunch of tires for Martinsville. I go down there, and you thought I was, man, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, they had all these tires piled. Now, they were used. Some of them, the sticker was just barely wore off. I mean, like, some of them might have had 20 laps on them. And I go down there, and I had this panel van truck, and I had that thing full of tires for Wilkesboro. And see, back then, you'd have Wilkesboro, and say, you might have... 15 tracks, but maybe you'd run the same number of tires at half the tracks. You didn't have a, a tire for every track. You might run Wilkesboro and, and Richmond and Martinsville off the same tire, and you might go to Rockingham and Darlington and Dover, and you run that compound tire. So and I went down there, and Kyle said, get what you want. Well, I took everything I get in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> and I come back and we mounted up about <laughs> honestly we had about eight sets of tires from Martinsville now they were old tires but man I was going down the road feeling glad with those tires then what we do qualifying then you go to Richard or Junior Childress used to with him you give them a hundred dollars you had your old tires on they give you a set of tires that might have two laps of scuff on them three laps you put them on a qualify here was the problem with doing that we got into a lot of races doing that, but you get your car set up with your old tires. When I'm talking about old tires, I'm talking about something they'd raced on a month earlier. It had, didn't matter if they had five or 20 laps on. You get your car set up pretty good. Well, then when you'd put their tires on, only had two or three laps, it, what it would do, the tires would stick so good, they would actually over-tighten the car. You would pick up speed. But if we would have had a set to, to put on before that to knew what, where we would know knew to got the car set up a little better for qualifying. So there was races that, you know, I mean, I, we was at Charlotte. And you was there. I'll tell you a little story about one of the reporters there. Uh, Gerald Martin. Martin. I think. Some of y'all was there. Uh, Tom Higgins. Yeah. I was there. So y'all was in this little old press room or something other. And one of the reporters come and told me. I don't know if you or not, but went down there. And we had an engine. We'd run two or three races. You go to Charlotte, guess what happens? Woods Brothers show up. Uh, Foyt shows up. Uh, Hall Sellington shows up. People run 10 races a year, 12. So we sat in there and we had a motor. We'd run a race or two on. And we was getting ready to try to qualify. The, we didn't never get there. You know, track would open like on Monday or Tuesday back then at Charlotte. We didn't usually get there at about. We missed the first day of qualifying. We'd be there for the second and third. So we'd qualify the second day. Naturally, it'd be 50 cars there, and we'd be 35th to 45th. And I'm like, God, you know, you go to the motel at night, and I'd be talking to Marshall, like, what are we going to do? I said, man, we need a half a tenth. You try and figure out what to do. So we get to track the next day, you know, and I go to whoever it was, and we boxed the car off, and, you know, I'd do a plug check, and Earl, I said, Earl Parker, champ, I said, can you, how much can I lean down, try to get a little more speed? You know, go a jet down here, I'll give you a plug or change a couple plugs to this cylinder, try to get everything you could. So we go down there, and this was 84, 85. Go down and qualify. We're on the hot seat. 
And when, say, the hot seat, there's 50 cars there, you know, what happened is, Elmo, I remember like yesterday, Elmo Langley and all of them stood on their time the day before. You could stand on your time then, and if it was fast enough, you didn't have to qualify the next day. My man, we was like 38, 39th, and I said, I told Marshall, I said, God, you know if a couple of cars pick up, we're going to miss the show. So we go out, it wasn't but like eight cars qualified, because what happened is the Bush cars practiced, or whoever practiced, track got slick and it got hot that day. Well, the people stood on their time, they're pretty darn safe. So we go out, qualify, and I cannot remember who the announcer was, but we was on the hot seat for about the last five cars. And they said, Ronnie Thomas on the hot seat, he might slide in this thing. And oh, um, Dole Ford, do y'all remember Dole Ford? Flag oh, yeah. Old dog and uh, Oscar Bowman. Do y'all remember Oscar yeah. Bowman? Track of they come over and they like they come on and said, "You gonna get in this thing?" Guess who was the the last car was uh, the twenty eight car. I don't remember who was driving it in eight, which was I, what year? Eighty four. I don't. would have been Kale. Whoever it was, I was on the hot seat. They go out to qualify, and I told Marshall, I said, well, let's start loading up. I, was, I knew. I said, the only hope I got, I said, man, I hope he blows up or spins out and hits. You mean, I, you hate to say that, but you did. I said, if they don't, if he don't, whoever it was, I, I think it was a 28 car, but whoever it was, it was a top name driver. I said, we're going home. And I was sitting in the car. I didn't even get out of it. We was in the garage. I was sitting there, and a couple of fish were around, standing there sitting in the car, and I said, Ronnie Thomas been bumped. I sat in the car, honestly, for about 10 minutes. Marshall sitting up on the, he jumped up on the table, you know, where the toolbox was in the garage area. And I was sitting there, and I was upset, and I said, I just cannot keep doing this. I said, man, it is friggin' hurtful. It's embarrassing. And I said, I just am not, can't keep doing this. So Oscar and him kept saying, well, hold on, hold on. It might be somebody don't get through this or something happens. I mean, they, a couple of officials want me in. We got along good with it. didn't happen, so we loaded up, and I told Marshall, I said, man, I just don't know how much longer I want to do this. But I sputtered in and out. You know, we'd run a race, and then uh, Bill France calls me at my shop. It was 85 or something. Go to Pocono. Always at Pocono. And Dar uh, Pocono and Dover. Most time you go there, had 40 cars starting field. Well, a lot of times it wouldn't be but 39 cars there. And Bill France called me. He said, Ronnie, said, you, you go to Dover, you'll get in a race. And I said, We don't have, I can't give you no money, but I can guarantee you'll get in. Okay, we go to Dover. I mean, didn't have no trouble getting in. We go to Pocono, we didn't have trouble getting in. So it got to being a deal where, and you know, we went to Martinsville, and there was five or six, so we made to Martinsville. We went to Bristol, it was four or five cars over. We went to Darlington, there was five or six, so we made it. But it was a struggle all the time, and it got worse and worse. And I'm gonna, I want to tell you a story about Sandy Jones. Do you all remember yeah. him? Yeah. And he worked for, um, was it Daryl? He went to yeah. work? Yeah. Okay, do you all remember he helped Jimmy Means? Everybody helped Jimmy Means at one point. Well, I, now I might be wrong. <laughs> yeah. But I, no, I'm wrong. I think it was, I think it was D.K. Ulrich. Yeah. Might be. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure it was Sandy Jones. Yeah. I want to make sure I'm I think I'm right on that. We go to Darlington. We had did have a backup motor, but it was an old one. We go to Darlington on Friday. Go out there to practice. Motor blows up the first practice. Marshall's there with me and uh. Another guy, Ronnie Kelly, from down the road, passed away. He, lately, he went with us. We changed the motor real quick. Go out to qualify the next day. I mean, that evening, guess what? Blow the motor. Now we're sitting there, and I said, like, God darn, it ain't but a couple of cars over. Man, and, you know, we was like 30th quick, so I said, what in the world can we do? So I didn't know. And you go over to Richard. Maurice wanted 3000 on a motor, and I didn't have it. We go to somebody else. Junior said, I, I don't have anything. I understand it now. So we didn't have the $3,000 to 
to rent the motor. So, and this is where I'm, might be, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Sandy Jones, but it was D.K. Earl's motor. D.K. had two cars down there, and I think Baxter Price might have been driving one of the cars. So we go down there, and they stood on their time the day before. Because when those bush cars would go out there Saturday, they slick, well, everybody, you know, it was hot, September. Cup cars practiced, and the bush cars practiced, the car track got slick. So we didn't have a, a motor. Sandy says, make sure I'm right, but it was one of DK's guys, did his engines. He said, we got an engine in a truck. If DK, DK will let you use it, you can get in with it. And he said, we've had it in, it just wouldn't make no speed. And I said, what? He said, it wouldn't make no speed. I told DK, I said, that motor will get in the show. And I went and talked to DK, and DK said, it ain't no use putting it in. It won't run fast enough to get you in a race. And I said, well, can I try it? And he said, it's no use. I sat there, and I said, well, what, what are you charging me to just take two laps with it to qualify? He said, Ronnie, take the motor and put it in the car and qualify with it. We got the motor, and that particular day is on Saturday. And if you remember, they closed the garage for lunch for like 30 minutes so, and qualified. We throw the, I mean, it was 90 degrees iron. We was putting the motor in, trying to get it in. To, you was on what they called a five-minute clock then. We pushed down pit road, and I'm actually wiping my hands off. Everybody was working, slinging stuff on it. We got it cranked up, and Oscar Bowman was running the scales, and we literally rolled the car up on the scales, and it kind of went like that, and he went, because, <laughs> you know, he was trying to get us through where we could qualify. Rolled off scales, and I had the car running. Couldn't cool it down enough, trying to get the motor warmed up. We get down there, and the guy then, he said, one minute. I said, okay. I said, so I, said I need to warm my motor up a minute. So I, so I said a minute, and he looked there, Five seconds, I had it running. I went out. We made the show. Guess who we knocked out of the race? D.K. Ulrich. <laughs> now, wow. here's what I don't remember. I don't remember if it was D.K. or D.K.'s car. Yeah. <clears throat> he comes over, and we had, I had a, then we had a fan off of a furnace, old furnace fan we had with us. We had it on the, it was this car right here. We had it on the nose of the car, cooling it down. And I told the guys, I said, I'm going to go over to the hot dog stand, get everybody hot dogs and hamburgers and drinks. So I go over to the hot dog stand. I get hot dogs, hamburgers, drinks for everybody. We had them laying on top of the car right here. Fans blowing. DK said, get my motor out, Ronnie. I said, okay. I said, DK, I'm just letting it cool down a minute. I said, it's so hot, you can't touch it. He said, I'll hurry up and get it out. Hell, everybody's sitting there, eating, leaned up against the car, sitting on the table, eating the food. D.K. Ulrich comes down. He said, I told you to get my effing motor out of the car. I said, okay. And he took his hands, and he put what food was on her, and he took that stuff, and he slung it on pit road. I mean, he actually slung that stuff. And he said, I said, get my motor out. And everybody just quit 30 minutes so we had to mow around and took it off to him. This where I wished I could say for sure, but I'm trying to say, Sandy, come on. He said, I told him that motor get in the show. So that was some of the fun. I talk about fun stories. It kind of made a long story. It's kind of a funny story how things go when you have a struggling race. But I want to say one thing on the struggling. There's a lot of people had it worse than me. You know, I look back and I always said I had it rough, and then I find out, you know, I thought I had it bad, and there's people had a lot worse than me. I was talking to uh, Charlie Roberts from Aniston down at the Stocks for Tots. I think he said he run it four or five years or something, number 77, at Sonny King Ford all the time. He told me, he said, I did it to you. He said, I just couldn't afford to do it. And he said, it just, you know, you just lived a race, couldn't already put beans on the table. I mean, that's, you know, he had no reason to lie to me. So, we did a different route. You know, we weren't eating steaks. We weren't jet setting. We lived a very meager lifestyle. And, you know, if it hadn't been for my dad, 
I'd have been just like Oral Brooks. But I had him to keep me in check. So, you know, I hate we didn't run better than we did, but we did the best we could with what we had. When we got here today, you gave us some notes about your career. Right. <laughs> and if, if I asked every question that I wanted to ask about these notes, we would be here until Monday. <laughs> well, that's right. and he got it. So you go through the good stuff and throw um, the bad. There, there's one in particular, and I'm going to just read it word for word so I don't get myself in trouble. It says, to make ends meet in racing, I was approached by some big-name teams to bring out a caution for them, which I did, but I'm not proud of it. But we did what we had to do. I, I, I got I to hear that story. Now, before we get started, don't be fooled. We knew as press that went on. We knew these, those things happened. But we never really asked about it because we knew why it went on. Understand? Said, well, how can you blame this guy if he's doing that? Because he's at this end of the spectrum, and this guy is at that end of the spectrum and can afford to pay him. Didn't think there was anything wrong with it. I just thought it was part of the sport myself. That's me. Well, I, I did it for financial reasons. I understand. And other people, I don't, you know, I mean, we know of a couple people did it. I mean, when people show up with certain people's trucks and trailers and uh, two or three weeks after things happen, you kind of, you know, they could say it's bought, but you could figure it out. But, yeah, I, did I do it a dozen times? No, but I did it several times. You know, I did it in Daytona. I did it in Martinsville. Uh, I, here's the thing. I have been told by many people, don't mention the names because, you know, they won championships. So if I mention the names, it kind of puts a tarnish on their championship. But I will tell you, one guy, big name, it's, it's three big name in, names in racing, but this one particular one, he won a championship in the, I'll just say early to mid-'80s. It could be several different people, but he got hurt. And it's kind of funny is James Hilton had the deal. James missed a race at Martinsville. He comes to me and he said, you want to make some money? I said, how's that? And he said, bring out a caution flag early so we can get this guy out of the car and put the relief driver in it. And he was up near the front in the points. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, $1,000. Well, heck, I had to finish like 12th to get $1,000. And so I talked to the... And this guy, you see him all the time now. He's very big name crew chief, one of the bigger ones. He, he come, I go over and talk to him at the corner of the trailer, and I said, uh, what's, what's the deal here? And he said, I'll give you $1,000. I need early caution. And I said, well, all I can tell you is one thing, tell him you don't have to tighten your seat belts up. So, because it's gonna be a quick one. Here's the funniest, now you gotta realize I was in the back, sir. They dropped the flag. I go down in the corner and I just locked the brakes up going in the first corner. And I was running about 50 mile an hour when I spun around backwards. And Jeff Bodine won the race. I'm telling too much here. <laughs> get, get a but Jeff Bodine wins the race. I'm sitting backwards. And I can't remember if Oscar Bowman or Dole Ford was flagging, but I'm backwards in the first corner. They don't throw the flag out. Here they come out of the fourth corner. I said, I ain't friggin' moving. <laughs> they got almost start finish line and they waves a caution. I started up, I spin around. <laughs> I catch up to tail in the field. And of course you get the thousand dollars the next week at and I believe it was Wilkesboro. Where where we went the next week. I I get my money. I said, Ronnie Thomas come to the NASCAR trailer. Dick Beatty. You've been fined a thousand and one dollars. No, <laughs> I didn't get fined. I didn't get no. I didn't get fined anything because they couldn't prove anything. Going to trailer. Here's a deal with Dick. He always called me Ronnie, but if he was mad about something, he'd say, "Son, I never could figure it out." So I go to the trailer and said, "Shut the door and sit down." He may have a little like couch in there. Shut the door. Sit down, son. I said, "Oh crap." <laughs> I knew was. He said, "I gotta ask you something." I said, "Why'd you spin out of Martinsville last week?" 
kind of spun out. But why? The race starts. You go down in the corner and spin around. I said, Dick, I had old tires on. And you all know, people know now, we borrowed tires to qualify on. But when we started a race, we put our old tires on from a race or two before and had laps on. I said, I had those old tires on, and they were hard. They were hard, but wasn't that hard. So, so I said, I hit the brakes and spun around backwards. And he, I said, I was just running so fast when I went down with them hard tires. He said, you don't run fast enough to spin out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny, I didn't laugh then, it's funny now. So I go out of the trailer, I don't even get to my car, and they say, so-and-so driver come to the NASCAR trailer. And I told Marsha, I said, he's getting his little mouth full right there, of course. <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, and I did it Daytona one time. And when I did, here's the funniest one, Daytona. And I t I'll tell you this one. I did it for Junior. And then he, Marsha had this little thing. And here's what I can't remember. Now check it oil pressure, check the water temperature or something. I can't remember how it was. That was the cue for the caution flag. See, back then, it wasn't no lucky dog. Back then, if a guy was a lap down, if, if Kel was a lap down, but he got by the leader, caution flag come out, he made his lap up. Wasn't no giving you had to earn it back then. So, so you had a, actually a cue that if they said something on the radio. They would get with my, Mar with my dad or Marshall which was the crew chief, and I, I can't remember what they was either, the old check oil pressure, the water temperature, something like that. So I'm at Daytona, and like I said, if we'd been running, here's the thing about it. If I'd been running top 10 or top 15, I wouldn't have done it. We run, you know, when you run crappy enough, what's making a difference? So we got out there, <laughs> and we get out there, and they give me the thing, you know, the cue, and I said, okay. I flip, I throw the thing out of gear halfway down the back stretch. Well, I get to fourth turn. I'm like, God darn, I'm still running 90 mile an hour. I'm getting ready to go on pit road. I said, turn, I got to get slow. So I'm trying to slow down with the brakes, not let the car pitch forward. And I get slowed up. I stop at pit road entrance. So, of course, I stop. They throw the caution flag out. Truck pushes me, and we go down pit road, and Marshall raises the hood and acts, eh, he's looking yeah. around, looking inside the car. <laughs> Got it. And I take back out. <laughs> and then, of course, you get your parts. Junior didn't want too much on giving money. He liked to give parts. And you can't blame him. You know, Chevrolet was giving him stuff and all this. And I'd go down there and instead of giving me money, he'd give me, you know, a set of used heads and a set of 180-degree headers and stuff like that. And, you know, because I'm telling you what, those guys, people don't realize those guys made a lot of money off the little guys making them money. And, you know, the thing about it is, does it tarnish the sport? Well, you can look at it two or three different ways. Now, they don't have to have somebody to spend, which who knows what goes on now. But now you've got all these freaking lucky dogs. So most of the time you don't have to. They don't need it. They don't need it. Yeah. And, you know, to me, people don't like it. I kind of, in a way, think it's good. The old timers, people, me and older, they don't like this stuff of the lucky dogs and all, but you know, NASCAR's got to do what they've got to do to keep the sport going. So, you know, the thing about it is, instead of having the guy win it running 500, the guy at second run 500, the guy's third runs 497, the guy's fourth. Next thing you know, you get back 10th place car, he's 20 laps back. That, that don't really look good for the sport. And, you know, the way I look at it, what's it matter? When you get back to 15th or 20th, I guess in one way you say, what's it matter in one way? It gives them guys more TV time and everything. You know, the only time you can say it's bad is maybe somebody's running 20th all day and he gets in the lead and they have a rain mess up, cancer, and he wins. Of course, the guy that wins, it's a good thing for him. But, you know, it's just that's how much changed in the last 30 years. There's another note on here. It says, <laughs> Eddie Gossage practiced my car at Bristol. Yeah. What were you thinking? <laughs> we, went, we went to Bristol in 80. It wasn't this car. It was the Monte Carlo right after this. We went to Bristol, and I got the, still got the bill. I had it uh, 
it's laminated. A friend of mine laminates here. And it charged, charges $150 to rent the track. We took, we had two cars then. We took both cars and we played around with them, you know, to, cause, you know, we'd always get in, it could be 40 cars at Bristol. For some reason, I could always make the race. Even with had old stuff, I just like Bristol, got around our good, qualified seventh with Harry Hyde helped me one time. So it was just a place I like to race at. And um, we was our practicing and Marshall, and we had, uh, how many guys are there was about 15 with me because we got where we wasn't running a lot of race. I said, y'all want to go, you need to go because I don't know how much I'm going to be doing it. So it was about 10 or 12. Everybody took off work and went down. It was on a, it was a week before the race. It was like on a Thursday or Friday the week before. So we go out there and we practice and change the sprain, change the shock, take the other car, change a couple of sprains, do this, move a track bar. We just playing around with everything, seeing what worked and didn't. So they go to lunch, Eddie Gossage comes down. I can't remember if Ed Clark, was he at Bristol then too? He might have been. I tried to get in touch with him and ask him, but Eddie gets in the car and guess what? We had put a body on, at my shop here, put a new body on it. And did all the fenders out there, flared them out, right out right here at this little, little shop I had. So I said, Eddie, you want to take this thing out and run a few laps? Shoot, yeah. I said, you ain't going to go out there and run you a few laps. Guess what I did? Now, nobody's ever been me and Eddie. The guys went to a little store down the road uh, at uh, about a mile from racetrack at Bristol. A little store had bologna sandwiches and all that kind of stuff. I said, bring me something back. I hung her and I laughed. I said, I'll let Eddie slide it out there a few laps. Guess what I did? Brand new body. I forgot and left the hood pins out. He goes out, he goes down the back stretch, that thing goes, pow, when it hit the, it busted the windshield, it bent the hood up, it bent the roof up. Eddie's coming out going, oh, Lordy. I said, I don't guess I get no compensation since I asked you if you wanted to drive it. I said, I said and nah, I'm just kidding you, so I come back in, I'm sitting there, had the hood off. He helped me pull the hood off, and um, there's a boy there with me, a name of Terry Smuzzer, and he was with Pulled the hood off. We was beating it out, flattening it out. March come in. He said, what in the world? He said, we just put it. I told him what happened. He just shook his head. But, but you know, I took every guy. I'll tell you something I did. I don't know how many people ever did this. Every guy was with me before we left that evening. They said, you just need to be out of the track at 5. About 4.15, 4.30, I said, anybody wants to say they run a cup car can do it. Every guy with me got in the race car, and you know what to the person said, and I'm going to have fast to run. Back then, the pole might have been like a 16, 80, or 17 flat. They get out there, and I might run a 17, 30. You know what they run? I said, go on out and run it. Come in, how to run? Uh, 23 seconds, 25 seconds. What? I mean, I, and every one of them said, I got a admiration for it now that I didn't have. I always said it was a lot easier than what it looks like. That's why I say people watching on TV, when they got to the end corner driving, it don't look that bad till you get inside. Even if you're running 25th, see, the thing, Kel and Richard, Bobby on, Pearson, think about them. They had their deal they run. Here's our deal. We run with our bus, J.D. and, and Jimmy and D.K. and Baxter and, and all these guys. You're... You're back here running, Tommy, Gale. I just keep on naming. You're back here running. Here's what people don't realize. You're out here at, you're at Darlington or somewhere. You run at 155, they're running 160. Looks like they're running 100 mile an hour faster, but they're running five mile an hour faster, eight mile an hour faster. They go by you, you're with your bunch. Well, guess what? You got to get out of their frigging way. At the same time, you got to not mess your guys up. And it's kind of a deal where you're watching what they're doing and you're watching what you're doing. So it, it's a little tougher than what people think and you're trying to be very careful not to tire the car at the same time. So it, you know, those guys had it tough but it was tough in the back sometimes too. Steve, you know what that means, don't you? What's that? Forget the pace car. <laughs> oh no. If I had been there that day, <laughs> I could have driven Ronnie's race car. <laughs> 
Holy cow, man! You'd, you'd have been there. You'd have, you'd have got in it. Yeah, and I would have put that hood come up. You'd have lost a lot of weight. <laughs> and I would have put down a thirty-five second lap. <laughs> it's just different than people think. It just we went to Martinsville. Clay Earls is down there. Me and Buddy Arrington. You know how much Clay Earls charged me? It's nineteen seventy-eight or seventy-nine. I called Clay up and I said, Clay, I'm gonna try to. Come down and try to, you know, not qualify in the back. We see if we couldn't get a top 20 or 15th place qualifying. I said, we're going to come down. Might buy a new set of tires. Try it. And he said, well, come on down. Clay Earl said, Buddy Arrington's coming on Friday or something. Come on down. I said, how much? He said, you don't owe me a thing. And here's the funny. He had a key to the gas pump, the union gas pump. Here's the funny story. So we go down there and practice. And... Run, so it gets gets down in the afternoon. Wendell Scott's there. Had his work clothes. Of course, he wasn't racing. Had his work clothes on. My dad was there. Had his golf uniform on. I had a, as though I had a golf uniform on. I didn't, have, I didn't even put a uniform on to practice with. Well, nobody was there. So I'd go out and practice, you know, and get out. And no matter if he's dirty or what, get back in, practice. So that afternoon comes, my dad said, let old Wendell drive that car a few laps. I said, okay, well, sure. And I said, you run a few laps. I'm not driving it. And I said, well, if you don't drive it, I'm not letting it. Okay, you ain't gonna let, I'll get in. So my dad goes after and he runs five, six laps. We put Wendell in it. Wendell runs eight or 10 laps, get out, you know, and made me feel good. See, now, so much of this stuff is politicized now. It's what aggravates me. We did it then. It. We didn't see skin color with Wendell. That's the truth. I mean, my dad liked him. I knew him. I didn't know him like my Carl dad. Carl Brooks is his best friend. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people don't realize he drove my dad's car, what, 10 or 12 races? Mm -hmm. Nine races. I mean, the Petty Plymouth had two of them. So, I mean, so, you know, we let him run. Uh, my dad drove it. I drove it. And... Uh, I got to tell you about Wendell at Darlington real quick. I'm going to tell you what Earl Brooks did. So when practice is over, Earl says, I went on, I said, uh, I said, Earl, I didn't, you know, I knew him well. I didn't call him Mr. Earl. I said, hey, Earl, can I fill my car up with gas? Yeah, bring it on down here. So I go down there, and, and he said, don't, don't tell nobody. So we fill it up with gas. I said, hey, I got a couple of cans of my, Big old racing cans, can we fill them up too? So, yeah, don't, good golly, don't say nothing. So, go down and fill my gas cans up. And I said, hey, Earl, I got my truck here. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't, I ain't going to say what he said. I ain't filling that so and so truck. <laughs> so, I thought that was the funniest thing. I kept on, I ain't filling your truck up for you. I was going to get all the gas I could. But Jimmy Cox here was my dad's crew chief and run a few races himself and cut. 1970, I think, is when Wendell drove it at Darlington. 70 or 71. But anyway, had Star City body shop and put 34 on the door. So, take it back, it wasn't Darlington, I think it was Bristol. But after the race, I looked in a book one day, I think they got $400 or something where Wendell finished. Wendell had tore his car up up at Trent, New Jersey. I think it's like a 68 or 9... Ford Torino. So after the race, he comes up and, and I seen it in a program and I asked my dad about it several years before he passed away about the story. He said, Yeah, that's right. Come up and he give Earl, I mean give Wendell two hundred dollars. And he said, Wendell said, What's this for? And he said, driving a car. Wendell said, You're gonna pay me to drive your car. And he said, Well, let's help you out, Wendell. And I'm just saying my dad didn't tell anybody for years. See, my dad didn't do it for a reason. He didn't do it because of this matter or that matter. He did it because he knew where Wendell come from. And I think, I don't know the whole story on Wendell, but, you know, from what I understand, he put his kids through college. I'd heard. So, but, so that tells me Wendell must have been a little bit smarter than what people give him credit for. But still... You know, I know Wendell was going to race no matter what. He wanted to race. So 
you, you look back at this stuff and you wonder all these people, not saying Wendell, but when I talk to people like Irvin Brooks and um, Dick May, he's gone now, but um, Toucan, you remember a guy named Toucan? Er, uh, er, Irv, uh, he's from I, Pennsylvania. Wasn't he from Pennsylvania? Yeah, but he was working down here okay. three or four years ago at a truck team. Okay. And I run in Marv Acton, I think was his name. They called him Toucan. So I went and talked to him. I said, uh, you ever see old Dick May? He was still living then. He said, yeah. He said, um, uh, I said, is he doing all right? And he was living in a mobile home or something. He was really struggling. I mean, you know, a lot of people live in mobile home, but he was really struggling. And Marv said his check was 800 and some dollars. And he said, yeah, I see it. I've seen the check. So I'm just thinking, all them years Dick May raced, you know, he drove for everybody. Yeah. I mean, he drove five cars one race. And I'm thinking, man, he had a little trucking company. And you got to look, people got to want to race really bad to race till they can't go no further and they still keep going. So, you know, you kind of think, is it, you look at it, you can't, is it the love for the racing? Is it an addiction? Is it not being smart? But, you know, they did what they wanted to do. It was their life. And, and that's all that matters. But talking about Dick May driving, you know he drove five cars one race. A lot of people don't know that. Well, I was at Nashville in 80, I guess it was, and it was over 100 degrees when the race started. So during the race, everybody was getting relief. You, know, you didn't have all this heat stuff and all. You had a little piece of this stuff like this asbestos on the floorboard, and that was it. So I run about, it's 420 laps, I think, about 200 laps in the race. I'm like, uh, my radio wasn't working. We had a radio, we got it from uh, Billy Hagen's car, uh, Turley Bonnie's car, was it Billy Hagen? Yeah, yeah. We got a set of their used radios. One worth the worst money we ever threw away. Them freaking things wouldn't work. We had nothing but trouble out of them. They went out at Nashville and used to do a thing, you'd rub your helmet for relief. Yeah. See it? It'd be door push, you'd go by and you'd rub the top of your door. Right. Uh, door push, top loose. You'd rub the top, that's when you come in and they know to tighten, you know, tighten you up and the other way on the door. So I got, they pulled me out. I couldn't even get out of the car. I was fumes and I go, they pulled me out. I'm laying over there and they throwed some, had some water towed on me and throwed a rag on me and five or six other people laying down everywhere. Got out and they said, and this is why I'm saying Sandy Jones. I'm confused on Sandy, but I think he was with Jimmy then. Maybe he went to DK. It was some kind of deal like that. Sandy's in there somewhere. Jimmy needs you get in his car. I I said, man, I can't hardly see. And he said, one, I said, I'm out of it. And he said, can you get in? I said, tell him give me about five or ten laps. They go, about five laps, ten laps later, which is quick at Nashville. Man, I get up, and I'm, I'm not dizzy-headed, but I'm light-headed. So they pulled Jimmy out and they put me in the car. And a lot of people don't. Jimmy Means was a pretty hot driver at Dashville. Knew how to set up a car. I got in that thing. Guess who was in my car? Dick May. So I go out there, get in. I come up on 25. <laughs> <laughs> so as I come up, I said, there I am passing my car. And got out. But you know why? I got out and I told Sandy Jones, got out and he said, God, Ronnie's running that thing too hard. But I wasn't going to run it. To wreck it, I had to respect. But got out when Sammy Jones, Sandy Jones said, "Boy, that thing was getting around the racetrack." And I said, "That thing handled so good." But I didn't know then that Jimmy had run so good at Nashville. He knew what to do to the car to get it to work there. Yeah, yeah. But I think I'm right on Sandy on that. You, if I'm wrong, we'll know about it. But <laughs> I think it was Sandy. But I got in Jimmy's car for about 100 laps. And then Dick May got out, and I got back in my car. But you didn't know who was driving who that. I never get that <laughs> night. It, it was a mess. <laughs>